In the year 1900, during an age of unprecedented scientific, military and industrial change, the largest empire in the world, an empire upon which it was said the sun never set, was at its zenith. The whole of Canada, Australia, India, South Africa and some 200 other territories were the great realm of one person. A queen and empress in whose name one quarter of the world's population were ruled. A depressed and rheumatic little woman of five foot, dressed only in black, wandered the small rooms of her private apartments at Windsor Castle, disconnected from everyone except an Indian servant and her doctor, and still in mourning for her beloved husband Albert. This was Alexandrina von Saxe-Korba Gotha, known to the world and to history as Victoria. She was the empress of the world's greatest empire. Her name denotes an entire era of British history, Queen Victoria. Mm. How do you feel about Queen Victoria? Because I, I get the sense you weren't as enthusiastic about her as some of the other people we've spoken of. You know, if I look at a lot of the people we've been looking at and talking about, and, you know, there's a lot of them are warriors and they've created something serious or they've changed the course of history. Well, I felt she did pretty much nothing. She mourned half her life. And uh, the other half of the life, she bitched her, her prime ministers. <laughs> so I'm not convinced, Gareth. Well, let me try and convince you. She had the second longest reign in British history. The only person to surpass her is the current queen, Elizabeth II. Her father was Prince Edward, the uh, Duke of Kent, who was the fourth son of King George III, who, of course, went mad. She wasn't expected to be queen. Her father was, was far down the line of succession at the beginning. And then, ultimately, it fell to her. There was a bit of a succession crisis because the only heir had died, and suddenly it looked like Victoria's father had to produce a child. So he quickly found this German princess, whose name was also Victoria, and, uh, and they had a kid some months later. She became the empress of the, what, one quarter of the world's surface at one point. Yeah, um, and it, it she was, was fifth in line. At, uh, at, the, at the beginning, at yeah. The beginning, yeah. It was said that when Victoria was queen, the sun never set on the British Empire. Mm. At some point, there was always sun on some part of the British Empire. I mean, that's enormous. It is the largest geographical and territorial piece of earth ever owned by one person. And remember, it is owned by the sovereign and it continues to be the largest that's fair enough but i think she was in seclusion after albert's death so i don't think she saw it where the well look sunset she, she had a bit of a bizarre childhood and i'm not going to be her advocate here but i'll try and explain it to you like this her mother was a bit of a crackpot her dad died when she was one her mother loved her intensely and wouldn't let her out of her sight she was very careful to keep her within the confines of her mother's proximity, didn't introduce her to any dodgy people. I mean, some of her uncles were the most unbelievably badly behaved people in human history. They had mistresses and illegitimate children and wild parties and drank too much and ate too much. And so I think the Duchess of Kent tried to keep Victoria safe. As a result, until her 18th birthday, she basically slept in the same bedroom as her mother for all of her time as a, as a minor. She had a dog called Dash, who was a spaniel, who was her real only friend um, besides her mom growing up. So she, she grew up in complete seclusion. And as a result, you know, every man she met, she fell in love with, including her first prime minister, Melbourne. She took over at 18. She was crowned and he was her first prime minister. And he also sort of was a father figure to her in some ways. Um, and she was absolutely inconsolate when he was voted out and Peel was voted in. She didn't like any of her prime ministers after that except Disraeli. And she did struggle to have real relationships with men, although there are stories now about many of the men that she had during her life potentially being romantic interests of hers. Of course, the most famous one was her husband, Albert, who was a German prince. Uh, she said uh, some very nice things about him. Let me read this. This is when they first met. She said, Albert is extremely handsome. His hair is about the same color as mine. His eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth. But the charm of his countenance is his expression, which is most delightful. 
another man who her uncle wanted her to marry, Alexander of the Netherlands, on the other hand, she described as very plain. So she really did love him, and they were together for a long time, produced nine children. Yeah, that's that's incredible. So she was pregnant for a long time. But yeah. Al- Albert, I mean, that was... She was pretty much pregnant the whole time yeah. they were together and married. But Albert was studious, and he just worked himself to death. Albert was actually a very clever man, um, and that was rare in the aristocracy because most of them were quite lazy or eccentric or murderous. And he was an engineer or a wannabe engineer and a wannabe architect and a wannabe scientist and a wannabe inventor. And he put on the Great Exhibition and did much to forge Britain's place in the world as a scientific, industrial and, and technical leader. And really, during her life, I think you could say that there was so much change in the military, the scientific and the engineering world that much of that must have been brought on by, by Albert. And she was hopelessly devoted to him. Their nine children ended up producing children who would rule all of Europe. And she had the, the slight misfortune of, of seeing in her latter years and obviously in her children's reigns just the, the fighting of cousin upon cousin and the, the destruction of all these ancient empires and even the hemophilia which was carried through her genes to the Romanovs and others. But effectively, her eldest grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm II, would be head-to-head against her own son, Edward VII, and then later on George V uh, in World War I. But just going a little bit back now, because maybe I'm being a bit unfair, but what I really saw as her finest time that I can see in looking at her was when she was 18. She was woken up at 6 a.m. in the morning by the Privy Council who came to tell her that her uncle, the king, had passed away, and she was now queen. She did not call her mom. She did everything on her own. She sat in a high chair around these tall men. She was not intimidated. She remained calm. She knew her place. She knew that she was queen and she knew what she wanted to do. She was she was very strong. She was iron-willed. And that gives a little bit of insight into the relationship with her mom. Yeah. Because her mom and... Um, Sir John Conroy. Conroy. They were, they were in cahoots. And to a certain extent driving towards becoming regent before she turned 18 and even trying to change the majority to force her to only be able to come to the throne when she was 21. So she banished her mom to the other side of the castle mm-hmm. and kicked so old John Conroy as out. far as possible. He obviously tried to make a comeback here and there. Yeah. But um, and and that was very very impressive. That was that. Was, I mean, for an eighteen year old, that, that is, was incredible. It's quite, especially when it was as sheltered as she was. Exactly. Yeah. Privately, she was a very much a family person. She and Albert, with all their children, were a tight knit family. She did exercise quite a lot of political influence on her prime ministers, and she tried to involve herself in politics in a way that most modern monarchs wouldn't. She had dynastic ambition. She definitely wanted to see her children and her grandchildren well-placed in society. But publicly, she gave off this air of morality and strictness, you know, standards, and, and wanted to be perceived as a national icon. And of course, all of that came crashing down when her husband died. He died in 1861, and she just disappeared. She went into mourning, wore black for the rest of her life, lived only at Windsor, Balmoral, and the Isle of Wight, Osborne House, Um, was hardly ever seen by her her people. I think she made an appearance a few years later at her, first of all, Golden and then Diamond Jubilee, and they were just ecstatic because the Republican movement gained quite a lot of ground while she was quiet. I mean, when there's no king at home or no queen at home, people tend to behave badly, and there was even someone who posted a notice on Windsor Castle saying, uh, this place is up for sale, they're going out of business. But I think Disraeli got her out of sort of out of seclusion. And also her gardener or horseman, Tom Brown. Well, this I is mean, interesting. The, the, you people, know, the, the people of for her time, they hated it. For her time, she was an incredibly open-minded woman. She was very into multiculturalism. So she had one or two interesting things. I mean, you mentioned Disraeli. He was the first ever Jewish prime minister and Sephardic Moroccan Jew to boot which was quite extraordinary for the time. There was still a lot of anti-Semitism around. She had uh, her mufti, uh, who she loved, her munshi, sorry. His name was Abdul Karim, who taught her Urdu. And she learned that late in her life. And when her prime minister and a lot of her advisors and her son tried to get 
rid of the Munshi, she got quite upset with them and called them all racists. So, I mean, this was in the late 1800s, early 1900s. She also had John Brown, who was a Scottish man who looked after her in her dotage and kind of brought her a little bit out of mourning because she hadn't had any other male influences in her life at that point. She was really only dealing with the business of government and managing her own family. And John Brown was this gruff Scottish man who had grown up in the Highlands and would take her on long walks and force her to get on and off of her horse on her own. And, you know, he, he, he used to say, come on, women. He talked to her like that. And she, she wasn't sure how to deal with this. Yeah, that's right. She was, he did talk very rapidly. She was, she was so used to being deferred to. And the British public hated Hated John Brown. Well, I don't know if they did because they were poisoned against him by her immediate circle who thought it was inappropriate for her to have such a close relationship with him. In fact, when she was buried, she had a lock of his hair and a picture of him in her hand and it was disguised under a bouquet of flowers so that her family wouldn't see it. Sure, that's incredible. Yeah, it was one of her last wishes. So she had a very close relationship with him. But she went deeper into mourning again because his brother murdered him. Yeah, and she was sick at the time. He was meant to be looking after her. And uh, it, it, it just didn't go well. The poor woman was surrounded by tragedy. So I suppose you've got to be a little bit more forgiving. No, no, I am. I was being a bit facetious. Look, she, she did. It was an incredible era. It's called the Victorian era. Yeah. If we look at her children and her grandchildren, the grandmama of Europe. Yeah. She was also, in some ways, quite traditional. We mentioned earlier the morality and the strictness, but she didn't like the idea of votes for women. She thought that was a very bad idea. Um, she liked being a woman. She liked being treated like a woman. She told Disraeli, flattery always helps you, but with royalty, you should put it on with ladles. So you should use an excess of flattery. She didn't like Russell. She didn't like Gladstone. She thought he mm. was very boring. And not particularly fond of Peel. But she got involved in all the events of her time. The Irish potato famine. The war in the Crimea. The Indian situation. She was the first empress of India. Correct. And she was beloved by the Indians mm. at that Disraeli point. Disraeli actually, uh, I think he promoted he her. Yeah, to he arranged that. for her to be called empress. She quite liked that title too. And by the age of 81, when she eventually died, she had very bad rheumatism. She was blind mostly because of cataracts. And she had been a very studious and worldly human being during her life. She'd recorded almost everything in a set of diaries, wrote 2,500 words a day on all of her experiences. So we had a chronicle. And her, her youngest daughter, Beatrice, then transcribed all of that and burnt the originals, unfortunately. But you, I think she also doctored it a bit. She, she did. She, she, some she of would have left out stuff. the John Brown stuff and the, Correct. the Munshi and all that kind yeah. of thing because I think the Queen was quite devoted to those people. Mm. And perhaps even some of the stuff around her arguments with her son, Edward VII, because she blamed him for Albert's death because yeah. he was a philanderer and he was a bit of a man about town. He used to be a, you know, badly behaved and didn't exactly bring glory onto the monarchy. And then I think um, Albert went to go see him. Albert was very sick. I think nowadays they're trying to think possibly he had stomach cancer. But well, they, but well, they, they say they he died of diphtheria, but it could well have been because at that yeah. stage they didn't know how to diagnose these things. But two weeks prior to his death, he went to Cambridge to, to meet Bertie. and To upbraid him. Yeah, to bring him into line. And they had to walk. They walked for, for hours in the rain and she... Queen Victoria said, no, this, that, you know, that's the cause. That was the cause of it. But she had, funny enough, the, the German side of it was incredible, that Albert and Queen Victoria spoke German to each other, right. especially in private conversations, and they had to work quite hard to get the German accent out of Victoria. Yes, well, the Hanoverians were famously German. The first two kings only spoke German, and then by George the Third, he learned to speak English. But they all still had this... Way of speaking, I suppose, which we make fun of today. <laughs> what was interesting, too, is she spoke Italian, she spoke German, she spoke English, she spoke French, and she spoke Latin. And then later in her life learned Urdu as well. You can't really fault her for being lazy or being stupid. She was very small, and she was very unattractive towards the end of her life. I mean, she'd lived a long time. She was stout. Yeah, she, she put she on was, quite a lot of weight. Yeah, near the end, she was quite obese. <laughs> Not a great way to go. Yeah, Alice in Wonderland was... She was the queen in Alice in Wonderland. That's right. Uh, and there are lots of other ways that she's been depicted in popular culture since then. I mean, there's statues of her all over the world, in India and Canada and South Africa. 
all over. There's one outside the city hall of Peter Maritzburg. But I suppose what was interesting is when she died, there, there were three people there with her. The Munshi <laughs> and her eldest grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, who would go on to plunge them into World War I, and her son, Edward VII. They are Bertie. That's incredible. That's well connected. And she, by the way, was the first woman to, well, one of the first women to try chloroform during birth. She quite liked the effects of chloroform and said, said it didn't give me as much pain. Didn't love children. She thought no. they were all babies were ugly. Thought breastfeeding was loathsome and revolting. She had a wet nurse. Yeah. But uh, there we go. Queen Victoria. Hopefully you like her a little more than Anthony did at the beginning of this discussion. Thank you for listening to Season 2 of Blind History. This is one of the many episodes that we have planned for you, and there are plenty more to come. It's brought to you by Taylor Blinds and Shutters, only on cliffcentral.com.